a lot of investments in our country. They were not Filipino investments. They were by our colonizers. That should have taught us a good lesson in how to improve our economy. The British and I mean, the, the, the Singaporeans and the people from other countries like Malaysia, they, have, uh, they were colonized too. When they became independent, they did not think about, uh, about prohibiting foreign investments. In fact, they embraced continued investments into their country. But in 1933, 1935, we said we must define the elements of our constitution so that we can exclude foreigners from gaining from the benefits of our natural resources, the ownership of our public utilities, and so on. What was the result of that? We introduced the basic laws that were in the so-called, uh, in, in the special laws, uh, uh, that brought up uh, the section on national patrimony. Without going too far on that, we know that this thing brought into our controlling legislation the fact that no one can own land by foreign, no, no foreigners could own land after independence. No, uh, public utilities must be governed by us and so on. These were good intentions, but they were, I think, selfish intentions because we wanted to, to gain all the benefits of progress and not, and not allowing foreigners to participate in this. So what happened? We had these provisions and most of us have written about it. I have written about the provisions of the constitution and I have said this, these provisions which were introduced in 1935 were the original scene of our failing to avail of good foreign investments into our country. Many people do not believe that because we wanted to get all these things undertaken by us. I mean, the main industries anyway. But what did, what did that do? It made many of our leaders try to concentrate on allowing only this limited group, I mean, Filipinos to handle these basic industries. So in the course of our independence, we, uh, our, uh, we, we didn't have sufficient capital. So we, did, we gave poor service and we did not bring in foreign capital because our constitution prevented this. So what happened? We had bad service in electricity, bad service in telephone, bad service here and there, and uh, bad service, uh, water became our activities and so on. Well, I am, I, I'm, I'm making this because uh, uh, I, I'm trying to bring the point that because we failed to invite foreign capital to assist us and always uh, limited their role, we were unable to become a modern entity that fulfilled the promise that the Philippines would be the most effectively likely to succeed country at the end of World War II. Did we succeed? Well, a lot of us well-intended people. We were brought from government, we tried to help and so on. Uh, the main rules have been there, we could not revise them. And so I wrote this article the other day. Perhaps I should read it, but uh, I, will not, I will not go on because some of you have read it. And if you have not read it, please put that in the records of my discussion so that I don't have to repeat them. What have I said basically? The, we must get rid or amend the, the provisions of the constitution that limit the participation of foreign capital. Of course, we are told we have just done this about last, uh, uh, during the, uh, the last days of the Duterte administration. Uh, three major laws were passed. I agree they were good, but they're insufficient. They are, uh, they are good indicators that we welcome the opportunity. And the fact that Congress worked hard, worked hard to get this done implies that there is in our country 
and in our leadership, a great amount of interest in getting a more liberal opening of the economy than has ever been, than has ever happened in our country. So uh, uh, because of this, I, I suggest that uh, any amendment of the constitution should be predicated on amending the, the restrictive economic provisions of the constitution. There may be political uh, uh, issues that are important, but if we do not amend these things, if we, not, if we do not get a major uh, effort to show to the world that uh, we are really inviting foreign capital, even the great effort of our president to ask uh, to travel abroad and, and try to convince big investors to come, will always say, what about your constitution? It's, it's very hard to say that the constitution, I mean, we, we can amend these things and we might be introducing right, left and right new amendments and new laws, but if they are there in the constitution, the constitution, litigators are there almost always pursuing the interests of those who oppose a few changes because it affects their business. And that creates a, an agenda for delaying and delaying, and in fact, not even, even pursuing the provision. So my recommendation is basically that we do get to amend the restrictive provisions as a matter of uh, primary attention. If we have other issues, you know, the president's term is six years, it's just half a year. Perhaps that, those things can await. If they await, if we can pass the, the required legislation amending them in the way that was suggested in, uh, in the last Congress, for instance, by the fastest means possible, we might get the, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, uh, push, a rocket boost to the efforts of our president to invite more foreign capital. Otherwise, I think we will still succeed, but we will be delayed. And then we will quarrel about the failure of our political system to get things done properly. And so we will be asking ourselves, what do we do? In my view, if, if we do the, the amendment to the, to, the constitutional, to, to the constitutional provisions that I'm referring to, and not include any political agenda or political uh, amendments, it will be better. If we bring in the political agenda or the political amendments sooner, mix it with that, argue that we need both, I think we are putting a poison pill to the agenda of amending the constitutional provisions. That to me is my main message. The poison pill will be there if you mix it with politics. We must go and proceed with the with the important amendment of the constitutional provisions that restrict foreign capital to enter the economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, as usual, a very profound uh, uh, exposition of uh, the uh, economic provisions change first before uh, political as a poison pill. So <laughs> thank you very much, uh, our uh, uh, Professor Emeritus of the UP School of Economics. Let me just therefore just also welcome the Honorable uh, Loreto Acheron, Vice Chairperson, presenting uh, General Santos. Uh, in Zoom, we have uh, Representative Robert Ace Barbers of Surigao, and the, we also have present uh, the Honorable Isabel Maria Zamora, Lone District of San Juan uh, City. And Honorable um, Manuel is here uh, representing the Kabataan. Welcome. So now let us hear uh, another professor emeritus for the UP uh, School of Economics, Dr. Solita Colias, uh, uh, Colias Bansod. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to come back back to
Okay. All right. I have an out. I mean, can we put? I have yes, a, yes. I think I'll start by only assist. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. Liberalization of the economic provisions of the Constitution. And my point is they are ne neither necessary nor are they sufficient. And I will look at the evidence that supports my view because nobody here is talking about evidence. I want an evidence-based decision-making. So what do, what do we mean when we talk? The outline is what I take it to mean. Next, please, next screen. Next slide, please. What I take it to mean, then we're going to ask why, what is the justification for lifting restrictions. Then we'll look at the, we'll look at the assumptions that underlie those, those ju that justification. And then we will look at the evidence that supports the assumption. And then we will focus more clearly on what the Philippine evidence shows. Because there are so many, so many researches have been done on foreign direct investment and its effect. Then uh, after that, we will talk, well, what's major takeaways. Okay, let me continue. Next, please. <laughs> okay, what it means. Yeah, that's what liberalization of the economic provisions of the, con the constitution means. You lift the constraints on for foreign ownership, on media, education, advertising, public utilities, land, and natural resources, right? Natural resources, okay. And the justification is that the restrictions have closed the door. In other words, binding constraint, kuno on foreign direct investment. It, it has been stifled. Therefore, there's lost employment, there's lost growth, other opportunities. It's, it's, it's beautiful to the ears. But the assumptions underlying those justifications is that all FDI is good. I mean, you know, just invite them in and it will, it will do, do good for the country, supportive of economic growth, employment skills, et cetera. And if you lift the economic provisions of the constitution, you will open the door to FDI. That's the, that's the narrative now. And does the evidence support these assumptions? Well, we will look at world evidence and we will look at Philippine evidence, the studies. With respect to all FDI being good, macro level data may show association between foreign investment and higher levels of, of income, but they don't establish causality. Similarly, no generalization can be made about the link between activities of foreign firms and income distribution. And we're all worried about that, right? On the macro or project level, a majority of projects definitely yielded positive effects on national income, but, a sizable minority, one third in two studies, anywhere from 25 to 45 percent in a third, had deleterious effects. So it's you know it's not a all good. The evidence on the relationship between FDI and development suggests that it is hard to make broad generalizations, and the impact depends critically on the purpose and type of the investment as well as policies and institutions in the recipient country. Tapos meron pang, you know, findings. You know, FBI, FBI is not homogeneous. It's, it comes in all forms. And there are four specific. Your FDI in extractive industries, natural resources, FDI in infrastructure, FDI in manufacturing, FDI in services. Each brings its positive, uh, distinctive benefits and threatens such distinctive harms that you you know you cannot you put them all together using data streams on all four FDI's flows to try to find one relationship between FDI and host country welfare or total factor productivity or growth rate makes no logical sense says Theodore Moran who is uh, well it, it just leads to inaccurate substantive con conclusions. All right. And then it, what are the analytical results? Well, actually, FDI in firms producing primary products extracted. They, they're mixed outcomes. It helped spur development in Botswana, 
Indonesia, Malaysia, but it was problematical in Nigeria, Venezuela, Zambia, the Cong uh, Republic of the Congo, and Sierra Leone. I, in other words, <laughs> it, it doesn't help all the time. And uh, the, the FDI that produces for the domestic market naman, and relies heavily on subsidy or protection from competition is less likely to be beneficial and may even generate greater economic losses for the host country. This is the results of the studies, all right? The, it is the FDI that aimed at firms producing manufactured exports and operating in competitive global markets. That's the FDI that is most often found to have a positive effect on growth and development, manufacturing exports. <laughs> I want you to note that the economic provisions of the constitution do not restrict this kind of FDI, no restrictions whatsoever. <laughs> Let's go to Philippine experience with FDI, the studies, etc. Most studies on FDI in the Philippines during the early 1980s were actually critical of its imp impact on the economy. And, and, I, and I give this, uh, these studies, Lindsay, Subido, etc. The Philippines, it said, the studies say lag, lag behind its ASEAN neighbors attracting FDIs. That's what the that was the study during the late 1980s to the 1990s, and the impact of protection, etc. Lamberte found that a liberal legal framework is not enough to attract FDI in the country. It must be complemented by sound macroeconomic policies, particularly in managing economic growth foreign exchange wages, which were found statistically significant in the regression analysis done in the study. So that's your experience. Meron pang si Aldaba. Aldaba is a, now an undersecretary in the Department of Trade and Industry. You should ask them. You, su you should ask their uh, opinions in it. And, uh, and uh, she gives some good and bad results. There's Miranda who reviewed the employment effects and says that direct employment on all fact on all of foreign affiliates in all sectors was only less than 1% of total employment in both 90, 1983 and 1988 so there you know not good effect on that really significant and then fbi made significant contribution to the country's de develop although FDI made significant contributions to the country's development, its impact on technology transfer, productivity, domestic linkages, and employment are limited, and so on and on, so on. Austria found mixed results, a positive but statistically insignificant relationship between FDI and total factory, factor productivity growth. This is evidence on the effect of FDI on the Philippines itself. On the other hand, with total FDI and manufacturing FDI as determinants, it yielded significant effects, okay? Manufacturing FDI. World Bank, sabi ng World Bank, eh, you know, the importance, they, they fo focused on the importance of creating an enabling environment and good investment climate to attract FDI with key factors such as macro, macroeconomic fundamentals, infrastructure, governance, and institutions. And the congressional, your congressional uh, uh, budget office, yes, you know, identify the factors dis discouraging FDI, your research, which included the high cost of doing business, high risks related to policy inconsistency, policy instabilities, peace and order, has nothing to do with the Constitution, for God's sake. Okay, marami pa, in, in incentives, etc. But essentially what they're saying is to improve the country's investment climate, it is important that the government immediately focus not only on inadequate infrastructure, but also on the country's low institutional quality corruption, inefficient bureaucracy, and continue to constrain 
that continue co to constrain doing business in the country. In other words, so far, what we've heard is nothing about the Constitution. And the Constitution does not impede manufacturing. <laughs> what impedes the FDI are all these other <laughs> factors that the Constitution is not supposed to do. Now, fast forward to 2021, we had one most recent a study on FDI uh, in 2021. This is by Parcon Santos et al. ASEAN, and it's entitled ASEAN Five Countries in Competition for FDI. And she, st she talks about, you know, the, the ASEAN are in competition for the FDI and what really, uh, what really, and she asks the question, what factors explain differences in foreign direct investment across this ASEAN Five? This ASEAN Five being Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And she asked the question, they asked the question, how do foreign investors choose across host countries? And then are sovereign credit ratings useful in determining an economy's activity for FDI? And what I found uh, nice about this, I mean, very uh, relevant about this study is that she talked about, you know, here are the locational factors, sovereign credit ratings. Ayan ang, ayan ang kuila niya sa kanyang econometric study using a gravity model, real GDP, corporate tax rate, minimum wages, human capital index, FDI restrictiveness index. That's very important. And, uh, and the, if you look at the, at, the, at the, you see where the Philippines talagang in corporate tax rate, well, even up to now, it's the lowest score. The basta pink, lowest score yon. Pag dark blue, highest score yon. So if you look at the Philippines, you see it, it's an, an awful lot of pinks. An awful lot of pinks. That's the lowest score. Rule of law index, ease of doing business, road quality index, lahat yan, pink. Okay? Ayan ang, this is from the ASEAN. Ayan. Tapos, she looks at the ASEAN, FDI inflows in the ASEAN over since 1980s up to now. And always since the 1980s, the Philippines has always had the lowest uh, uh, percentage of inflows in the ASEAN. And, when, and, and of course, when Vietnam came in, it just went forward like that. But always, Philippines is not only low, but getting lower. All right? Okay. And then here, the next slide, please. Total 10 recipients. Look at where the, the sectors are that are being invested in. These are the FDI, and these are by the recipient sectors in the ASEAN. Look at financial and insurance activities, get 28.7% of foreign direct investment. Manufacturing gets 23.3%. Uh, wholesale retail trade, 16.1%. Those three are already 68% of total FDI flows in, in, in ASEAN. And those three sectors are not restricted by the constitution. And yet the Philippines is getting low. So it's not the constitution. You're looking at the wrong place all the time. <laughs> Unbelievable. The, the Parcon Santos study, itong, ano sinabi, huh? the overall FDI restrictiveness index. What did they use? The OECD FDI restrictiveness index. You will remember, Mr. Chairman, when everybody was saying, Naku, we are the most restrictive. We have, according to the OECD, we are the most restrictive country. Hindi nila sinabi na until we became the most restrictive, China was the most restrictive. And yet China got most of the, 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 the bulk of foreign direct investment. You know, you, you choose this, this data. Anyway, the results of their econometric study, Parcon, in 2021, uh, showed that the overall FDI, I am quoting from her study, the results show that the overall FDI restrictiveness index is statistically 
insignificant. It means it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but you're using FDI restrictiveness as the, you know, I, I think the Congress is using that you know, as, a, as, a, as an opening door to get all its political, like Jerry Sikat says, you know, you, you're using this, but Jerry Sikat believes that you, you, know, you should remove the, I'm saying that the evidence shows that you don't have to remove it because it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. This is what this is what the studies show. All the studies show. All right. Okay. Is statistically insignificant for all investors when macroeconomic stability, governance, which includes corruption, ease of doing business, and quality of infrastructure are accounted for. Now account Murian, you get that you get that in good order and it doesn't matter what your restrictiveness is. This is what China showed. It was oh, I will show you later. Anyway, uh, will the liberalizing the economic provisions and I say no, it will not. It will not open the door to the FDI because it's already open. Okay. Uh, next 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 and then I will just Okay. In other words, you please next, next, next. Start until in other words, Iyan. In other words, the claim that the economic provisions of the constitution have closed the door to FDI are not borne out by the facts. Foreign investors are in happy control or in beneficial ownership, either by liberal interpretation, by def de definition through legislation, or the use of creative financial and other instruments. Next, amending the Constitution is not likely to open any new doors to FDI because for all intents and purposes, they are already open. That's why it's not necessary. And finally, amending the Constitution will not bring in FDI unless the factors affecting FDI are addressed. What are the factors? Infrastructure, you know, everything, governance, corruption, ease of doing business. <laughs> Jesus. So, Ayan, but the costs of undertaking the amendment may be really burdensome. There are direct financial costs associate, associated with the convening of the constitu constituent assembly or constitute constitutional convention, there are direct costs, there are opportunity costs, there is the risk that the constituent assembly may widen the scope of their deliberations. It is a, it is a real risk if the, and then the amendments are passed as proposed, there is a, the risk of increased rent seeking activities in the enactment of laws. This refers to the Congress. And there is also the risk of weakening of institutions. Now, I would like to say about the OEC, the FDI, which everybody, you, you know, the Philippines was in a panic. Everybody was saying, yeah, they were so restrictive, etc." cetera. OECD, IF, FDI Regulatory Restrictiveness Index. This came out first in 1997, then in 2003 and 2006, and then came out yearly since 2010. And in all those years, China ranked number one, the most restrictive country from the beginning. Up to 2014.426, mumaba ang restrictiveness yet. Yet China attracted the most foreign investment of all countries during all that time. That's a fact. That's the data. And the Philippines, okay, one cannot say that a country's high ranking in that index means that it is scaling away FDI. And furthermore, the, the, the time the Philippines took over the ch from China as the most restrictive, according to the OECD restrictiveness index, that was also roughly the time the Philippines made the news as being the ninth and then the seventh top investment choice in a survey conducted by UNCTAD. I mean, what more do you want? These are facts. I mean, not just Bukadura and, well, why was the Philippines so attractive all of a sudden? 
would that have anything at all to do with its attract if it's improved rankings in the CPI, you know, corruption, because the, the Philippines did have improved rankings in the CPI and the rule of law index. Unfortunately, this, those rankings were also so short lived. Bumabarin yung ranking natin afterwards. So that's it, folks. The major takeaway then is the evidence, the evidence from studies conducted both abroad and domestically do not support the underlying assumption that FDI will lead to growth and other goodies. The most recent study shows that the overall FDI restrictiveness index is statistically insignificant for all investors as long as macroeconomic stability, governance, ease of doing business, and quality of instruction infrastructure are accounted for. Third, amending the constitution is neither necessary nor sufficient condition to attract FDI and may entitle and un bur uh, burdensome, burdensome costs. In other words, the costs of amending that FDI are going to be much greater than these illusory benefits. And fourth, the OECDI OECD FDI regulatory restrictiveness index cannot be used to show that restrictiveness blocks FDI inflows into the Philippines. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> Thank you for that very emphatic uh, presentation. Of course. And that lecture as usual. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So just to be able to acknowledge, uh, we have also Mr. Sani Africa of Cuban Foundation, Mr. Aris Arugay of the... Uh, Utility of Science Department, we have already at uh, Toti Chicamco, and we have uh, Secretary Margarito Tevez. Also, we have with us our uh, Chairman, Congressman uh, Richard Gomez. Uh, thank you. So at this point, let me just uh, turn over to our, uh, uh, for the next uh, in the list, uh, our Senior Vice Chairperson, Nonoy Defensor. Thank you, Chairman. May I recognize Mr. Sani Africa? who is the executive director of the Ebon Foundation for his presentation. Okay. Um, magandang hapon. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the invitation. Um, Ebon is always happy to try to help give perspective uh, to many things taken for granted. Um, I have a much shorter presentation, but I think it's important to, to be able to um, stress some points. Um, I'm, I'm a bit depressed now to be following Professor Munson's presentation. Um, uh, Iban can only speak for itself, but um, we want to put on the record, we have been in touch with some of the country's biggest trade unions, peasant groups, um, other urban poor groups in the Philippines. And um, we cannot speak for them, but um, in large part, our position closely reflects um, theirs as well. So I just want to put that on the record. Um, Iban Foundation um, is not agreeable um, to the changes in the economic provisions. Um, we think they should be retained. And if anything, um, well, we should be maximizing our other strengths as an, as an economy as well. Um, we have five major points which we are would like to make um, to invite the committee to be a bit more circumspect about the proposals, um, especially following from Professor Mansod, um, the insistence that there's some kind of magic bullet to open it up to constitution, opening up to FDI, and then causing um, development. We did submit a position paper, um, so I'm just going to read from the, the key points from that. Uh, the first point, well, we do agree always about the potential benefits from FDI to various sectors and economic activity. Um, proponents have always talked about that, so we're not going to dwell on that. Um, I, th I think that's taken for granted. But we do want to stress as a second point is that for investment has to be regulated to contribute to national development. Um, the potential benefits are well known, well established, they're real, but they're not intrinsic to foreign direct investment, they're not spontaneous, and they will only materialize in the proper policy context. Um, we're of the view that foreign investment would only materialize in the context of a particular um, policy, um, usually called industrial policy, industrial and technology policy, or national industrialization. We think that is a starting point because we argue we have to ask first how to make FDI contribute to development before asking how to attract FDI. Um, and are you a percent ng slides? <laughs> Sorry po. 
Sige. Anyway, um, so this just actually stresses um, in visual form what um, Professor Monton said. Um, despite our constitution, FDI has been increasing. The first wave was in the 1990s. The next wave was in the 2010. So we actually have um, greatly increased foreign investment in the country. Um, we do think that foreign investment, our third point, can be a, a tool for development. We disagree that there are binding constraints. If anything, we would argue that after 40 years of liberalization, they're among the last remaining regulatory tools we have to hold on. Um, it would be nice if we had more policy measures that we didn't sign off on our performance requirements in our FTAs. But, you know, we work what we have. And if anything, we do think that um, rather than further reduce the economic to policy toolbox we have, we should actually be um, expanding it. Um, we do think that equity controls can be used to exercise control over foreign capital to ensure technology transfer, for instance, um, to get learning production advantages and also for capturing economic um, surpluses. Uh, the constitutional compulsion is much um, much hated, but we, we think it is a powerful point of policy leverage that can be used to the country's benefit for strategic economic development. Um, and we are worried that taking away that leverage now will actually even worsen um, our policy space, will even lose our policy flexibility, um, especially if foreign investment becomes more entrenched in certain sectors. Um, there is It does create um, opportunities for more influence on um, economic policy making. Um, we do grant that the use of um, such regulatory measures has depended on specific country historical context, but we also argue that the direction of regulation is clear. Um, and we also argue that um, we can only develop creative ways of benefiting from foreign investment by actually doing it, um, not giving up everything, um, especially amid current global conditions. Um, our fourth point is that, um, next slide please, um, Again, in a very generic sense, it's, it's consistent with some of the studies mentioned by um, Professor Monsod. Um, clearly, despite vastly growing foreign investment inflows, we have not seen the national economic progress that has been promised. Um, the chart on top shows the production sectors, manufacturing and agriculture as a share of GDP. Um, since I don't think coincidentally, since the period of trade and investment liberalization in the 1980s, manufacturing has fallen to its smallest share of GDP and its smallest share of employment since the 1950s. Um, agriculture, a different point also, is also at its smallest share of GDP and um, employment in the country's history. Um, that is, despite hugely in, um, huge foreign investment coming in. Um, next slide, please. Um, I apologize for not being able to see it, but it's just to clear, clarify our point. It should be very striking to many that the Philippines now has more foreign investment in absolute terms and as a share of GDP than Taiwan, South Korea, and China in their respective periods of economic takeoff. Um, and it's it's a huge, it's a really huge difference. Um, if you look at when um, South Korea and Taiwan were in their periods of economic takeoff, they had one fifth of a percent of GDP um, in terms of foreign investment inflows, half a percent in terms of um, fixed capital formation, um, barely two percent in terms of um, the foreign direct investment stock. If you compare that to the Philippines right now, we have 2.3 percent of GDP um, in terms of um, inflows. Um, our GFC, our fixed capital formation, it's over 11%. And a stock of GDP, it's a huge 30%. And just to really stress that point, 30% of um, FDI inward stock, uh, sorry, FDI inward stock is 30% of GDP compared to, in the case of South Korea, 1.7%, in the case of Taiwan, 5%, and the case of China, 0.7% in the 1980s. So I think that um, should draw attention to why did they benefit from the tiny foreign investment they have? Why are we not benefiting from the huge foreign investment we have? Um, next slide, please. Um, this is our last point. Um, if anything, um, global conditions of increasing global protectionism, investment controls, and eroding multilateralism should make thinking about foreign, relaxing foreign equity restrictions even more inappropriate. Um, the most powerful capitalist economies right now in the world are at the forefront of thousands of protectionist measures, both trade and investment. Uh, the chart on top comes from the um, UNCTAD. Uh, they are counting the amount of, oh, sorry, from Global Trade Alert. They have, mount, they have seen increase in trade protectionism since the 2008-2009 crisis, especially increasing since the pandemic with a corresponding drop in trade flows. It's been flattening for the last decade. So anyone thinking that expert-led growth is a way out of our underdevelopment, um, I think that door has been shut um, for, for about a decade now. Um, last slide, please. 
Um, if that is the case in terms of trade protectionism, that is also pretty much the case in terms of investment protections. Um, this is from the latest UNGTAD World Investment Report. Um, they were tracking new investment measures, very markedly decreasing liberalization measures, and very markedly increasing investment restrictions. Of course, it's always packaged nicely, national economic security or whatever, stopping the Chinese from stealing our semiconductors and things like that. But the bottom line is the global policy trend right now has been reversing from globalization. Um, I just saw on my... Uh, our office yesterday, um, the latest um, issue of The Economist, it's actually complaining about increasing protectionism worldwide. Um, that is not something that can be wished away by loving our economic textbooks. That is something, a reality that I think we have to be navigating, not just in the next year or so, but probably in the period to come. Um, the bottom slide also shows the basically flat in many years declining investment inflows um, uh, because of these protectionist measures. Um, my very last point, I think, Again, this actually quite supports um, Professor Monsod's um, um, emphatic presentation. Um, the bottom slide shows the OECD Investment Distinctiveness Index. Um, that, that's the bar chart. Uh, the red dots show foreign investment inflows. Um, if it was true that this investment restrictiveness were sense investment inflows, you wouldn't have basically the same amount of investment inflows as share of GDP across the whole range of restrictiveness. Um, the Philippines is that little blue line there. We are near the right, but we're also quite neighbors with um, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. It hasn't actually made a difference. And countries on the left are among the most open countries in the world in terms of this fabled OECD index, but they're actually not getting much more investment. So I think there's a little um, pull dock lang this a point, Professor Monsod. Um, so our bottom line is foreign capital can contribute to development, but if you don't have the domestic conditions in place in terms of industrial technology policy, in terms of all the other things Professor Monsod mentioned, that actually puts us on the path of a well, I think further decline, which we have been facing for the last 40 years right now. We do believe in the state. Ibn's always said that, you know, why the case always complain of the government. We do believe in the state, but we do particularly believe in a state that responsibly uses the economy to for strategic economic development. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I recognize Dr. Aris Arugay, who is the chairman of the Political Science Department in UP Diliman. You're recognized, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice Chairperson. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Uh, I represent the institutional position of the UP Department of Political Science, composed of more than 20 members of the faculty, some of whom are with me uh, at this moment. Uh, the Department of Political Science also submitted position paper to the committee, and uh, I will draw my uh, remarks from that uh, position paper. We would like to thank the House Committee on Constitutional Amendments for the invitation to comment on the bills proposing to amend the 1987 Constitution. We acknowledge the continuing effort of the committee to listen to different sectors, including members of the academic community, as Congress ponders these bills related to amending and or revising the Constitution. Our last engagement with the committee was on February 12, 2020, before the lockdown due to COVID-19. Constitutional revision is an arduous task requiring care and rigor as it has long lasting effects on our development trajectory and political development as a democratic nation, which has consequences that may both be intended or unintended. In making this paper, our intent is to share critical insights, to draw attention to issues that we hope the respective committees in Congress as a whole and in the executive branch would consider as they contemplate charter change and amendments as well as electoral and political reforms. So we basically followed the three guide questions that were sent in the letter addressed to, to me as chair uh, on the need to amend or revise the constitution. Historically, Philippine initiatives to change the constitution were made to break from the immediate past and usher in a new political order. For instance, the 1935 constitution provided the transition and vision of a post-American colonial regime in the Philippines. The 1973 Constitution institutionalized one-man rule. The 1987 Constitution dismantled the dictatorship and offered solutions to heightened social injustices that authoritarian rule has engendered. Furthermore, institutionalizing democratic checks and balances across the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the government, as well as civil society's power in relation with the state. Simply put, over overarching change envisioned in the current constitutional reform process must articulate the nature of the break that it wishes to achieve. 
must also be crystal, crystal clear that the problems that charter revision wishes to address cannot be done through constitutional amendment, regular legislation, and or executive action. Our people need to hear from the political leadership answers that are based on grounded and as what Professor Mensud mentioned, evidence-based claims. Our people deserves no less. While constitutional amendments may not require any special historical moments, revisions in practice were usually undertaken after some major upheavals like revolutions, coups, post-colonial wars, democratic uprisings, post-peace agreement managed transitions, or after regime change, uh, such as left-leaning governments that were elected to power in several Latin American countries. Since, 19, uh, since 2016, several proposed resolutions in both chambers of Congress, including those favoring the federal shift or of charter change, claim that there is public clamor for the shift or change. Opinion polls belie this. A January 2018 Pub Pulse Asia survey showed that around 67% are against changing the charter during the time the survey was conducted, while only 18% supported charter change now. The same survey also shows that 74% of Filipinos have little, almost no, or absolutely no knowledge of the country's constitution, with 69% of the respondents having a low level of knowledge about the federal system being proposed at that time. In Pulse Asia's survey of the most urgent national concerns, top responses include controlling inflation, improving workers' pay, fighting criminality, creating jobs, and fighting graft and corruption. Since 2016, not more than two to 4% of the respondents consider changing the constitution as urgent. Moreover, the claim that the clear majority received by President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is tantamount to a green light from the citizenry to proceed with moves to change the constitution is a misplaced presumption rather than a compelling fact. For one, amending the constitution was not a significant part of President Marcos's election campaign platform or legislative agenda. Further to the contrary, President Marcos himself pointed out the difficulty in terms of the public acceptability and legitimacy to change the constitution, saying that charter change would be taxing and tedious to push as an agenda because the public believes, and this is his own words, that lawmakers are merely pushing this to extend their terms. This prospect raised by President Marcos Jr. regarding the legitimacy to endeavor the change of the Constitution becomes even more dismal when we take into account the context of a Philippine economy that is reeling from the effects of COVID-19, high inflation, poor public infrastructure, and confronting the challenges to implement the Mandanas Garcia ruling and full devolution under Executive Order 138. The realities of the fiscal and logistical demands required to roll out credible and substantive processes to change the constitution, make it even more a problematic pursuit, especially in the face of more urgent and immediate local and national problems. Constitution making should be a national endeavor. We ask Congress to reflect on the following process questions to ensure a democratic process with democratic outcomes. How and what, at what stages can broaden participation take place in the drafting process? Should a national dialogue process managed independently by a commissioned or designated body be put in place? Should there be surveys to inform the dialogue process and drafting? Should there be online websites and other modes to receive proposals or submissions? Should the Constitutional Convention of elected and possibly in combination appointed delegates, would the design guarantee the election and selection of the country's best and the brightest? How would the authorities that will be put in charge of the whole endeavor process and synthesize the inputs from these participatory mechanisms? On the mode of whether to amend or revise the constitution, the question that my department asks, who is in charge? It is notable that post-Marcos constitutional revision agenda was always executive driven. The shift to the parliamentary system initiative under the Ramos and Arroyo administrations and the shift to federalism under the Duterte administration. 
In this regard, it is essential that current executive leadership define where it stands on constitutional revision and the process it envisions, as well as identify responsible authorities who will oversee it. Meanwhile, should it decide to constitute itself as a constituent assembly, Congress has to ensure that it will complete the process without taking time and resources away from other legislative priorities. Congress fashioning itself into a constituent assembly is indeed less costly. However, studies of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance raise the following dangerous drawbacks of such a body. The assembly may seek to advance its institutional interest at the disadvantage of other institutional actors. The political parties that dominate the assembly may lack internal democratic structures. The parties may tend to favor electoral systems that distort the distribution of representation and power. Excluded parties may resort to violence or not own the process. What measures can be undertaken to guard against these dangers? The alternative to a constituent assembly is a constitutional convention. According to the Institute for Political and Electoral Reform, members of a CONCON are more focused on their job of revising the charter, having been elected for that specific purpose. Likewise, a CONCON can be more democratic, transparent, and deliberative. However, a CONCON may not necessarily be more inclusive than a constituent assembly. Delegates elected solely for the purpose of constitution rewriting are not necessarily better than appointed ones. A case in point would be the 1986 Constitutional Commission, which produced a constitution that will now enter its 37th or 38th year, uh, only two years short of the longevity of the 1935 constitution. While the, con the 1987 constitution has been described by some critics as superfluous, it undoubtedly has very strong democratic credentials. In some, whether it's CONAS or CONCON, they both have advantages and disadvantages. A CONAS has the following advantages. Less costly and expensive, inexpensive, consist of skilled, experienced lawmakers, likely to lead to speedy and swift period of constitutional amendments. However, its disadvantages are limited participation of other sectors, lawmakers' vulnerability to partisan interests, popular legitimacy may be found wanting and lacking. On the other hand, the Constitutional Convention has the following advantages, encourages more participation from other actors, promotes diversity and pluralistic views and opinions, and delegates selected through popular elections. However, its disadvantages include much larger expenses entailed by electing delegates and separate deliberations, possibly more time-consuming process of preparation, deliberation, and finalization, and possible lack of accountability mechanisms, unlike representatives of Congress. And if I may add, possible clashes with Congress and other democratic institutions, as we have seen in the case of Venezuela and Bolivia. Uh, on the matter of the different parts of the Constitution- so How long is your presentation? Just the last part. Good, sir. Thank you. On the last part, uh, on the parts of the Constitution to be amended, certain bills, uh, we will no longer comment on the economic provisions, but on the proposed designated survivor law, by selecting a successor from the legislature instead of the cabinet, this proposal undermines the separation of powers. In other words, the president is the head of the executive branch, so succession should maybe come from the same branch. On proposals on the joint election of president and vice president, Considering that the Constitution is silent on the joint election of the President and the Vice President, a constitutional amendment may not be required to reform election rules and include a provision for tandem voting for candidates on a common ticket. I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aris Arugay. I would like to recognize Mr. Calixto Chikiamko, President of the Foundation for Economic Freedom. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Committee Chair Rufus Rodriguez, Honorable Members of the Committee on Constitutional Amendments, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The Foundation for Economic Freedom supports amending the economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. After being in place for more than 35 years, it has failed to achieve its stated objectives in its preamble, specifically building a just and humane society developing our patrimony and establishing a rule of law among its many other aspirations. After 35, 
years of governance under this fundamental law, poverty is still uh, prevalent with more than 80% of the population below the poverty line, which translates to 20 million Filipinos. In fact, SWS says that the poor and near poor is about 80% of our population. The protectionist economic model that it espoused produced, promoted a rent-seeking system, a system which manipulates public policy to produce or increase profits for a few. It is also exemplified by generating wealth without increasing value, such as monopoly rent or extracting wealth without increasing productivity. This is not a model that encourages sustainable growth for the economy as a whole. As such, our economy has fallen farther behind its neighboring peers. We have become more import dependent than ever, most especially for food. Our manufacturing sector has shrunk. Low productivity services power our economy. About a tenth of our population have, sent, have sought greener pastures up as OFWs abroad, ripping apart families and causing a brain drain. It's not only in the economic field where the failure is self-evident. We have failed to set up a rule of law. Dynastic politics along with weak and unaccountable political parties dominate the political system. Our institutions, most especially our bureaucracy, are weak, inefficient, and corrupt. To set the premise for our pos position, let me give two specific themes that run to the 1987 Constitution, which has crippled its ability to meet its stated objectives, protectionism and statism. First, the 1987 Constitution expanded the protectionist Filipino first and Filipino only provisions in our previous constitutions. Protectionism led to the dominance of inefficient and rent-seeking monopolies and egopolis. As a result, the Philippines became the most concentrated economy in Asia, severely limiting competition, the improvement of the quality of goods and services, and competitive pricing. In fact, a World Bank economist said that why are investments low in the Philippines? It is because of the elite capture of the strategic industries in the Philippines. And this, this is due to the protectionism enshrined in our constitution. The absence of competition and restrictions on foreign investment led to poor investment in domestic capacity of the Philippine economy. As a result, the country remains dependent on imports from food to machinery. The fact that these protectionist policies are enshrined in our constitution has also severely limited the flexibility and agility of our economy to adjust to the evolving realities of the world economy. It is also quite ironic that protectionism is supported by both the left and the right for their own self-serving reasons. The left to further its anti-foreign imperialist, uh, anti imperialist ideology, the right to keep their stronghold on the economy. Second, the 1987 Constitution reflects the statist ideology, the centralized control of the state over social and economic affairs. It is full of phrases like regulating capitalism and distributive justice. For example, Article 13 states that the state shall regulate the acquisition, ownership, use, and disposition of property and its increments. It is very statist and regulatory in its orientation. Moreover, the call for distributive justice mandates asset reform, whether on land, fishing rights, and exploitation of natural resources. Statism led to a regulatory, corrupt, and weak state. Overregulation shackled land reform as it saddled farmers with all sorts of regulations and restrictions. Assets may have been distributed, but the beneficiaries we're not equipped with the economic tools and freedom to develop them. Therefore, there is a need to amend the constitution specifically by removing the protectionist and statist provisions. These amendments will foster free markets, healthy competition, and economic freedom 
that will give wide space opportunities for development and prosperity among the citizens instead of merely serving the interests of a few. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, lastly, may I recognize the former Secretary of the Department of Finance, Secretary Margarito B. Tevez. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Senior Vice Chair Defensor, uh, Chairman Rodriguez, distinguished uh, members of the Constitutional Commandments Committee, um, my dear colleagues, good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, based on our review and assessment, we believe that the Constitution must be amended, but limited to removing its restrictive economic provisions. Our reasons are as follows. First, these provisions are outdated. These were incorporated in the 1935-73 and uh, even the more recent one, the 87 Constitution. Uh, the Philippines was then uh, pursuing up to at least 1973, the Filipino first policy as pointed out my by my colleague to counter American economic interests. No. However, with globalization, increase in foreign trade agreements and large corporations investing overseas, the current restrictive economic provisions are no longer aligned with these trends. This includes foreign ownership of land and exploitation of natural resources, foreign equity in mass media and advertising, education, and the foreign practice of profession. Countries in ASEAN regulate the ownership and use of land by foreigners through laws and other regulatory measures enacted by their lawmakers, not under their constitutions. Singapore, for example, allows foreign ownership of vacant residential lot or landed property subject to prior approval of the Minister of Law. Meanwhile, in Malaysia, foreign ownership of land is allowed against, uh, so other subject to the following state's authorities' approval, equity and paid of capital conditions and location of the land to be acquired. Just like these countries, we can limit the locations of the land that foreigners can acquire by banning their entry in more developed areas like Metro Manila, Metro Cebu, and other big centers. Priority should be given to idle lands in least developed areas where unemployment and income levels are very low. Removing restrictions in education can allow top foreign universities to build satellite campuses in the Philippines, similar to what Ivy League schools have done in Singapore, which can help improve the quality of education and facilitate the transfer of technology. Liberalizing the practice of profession can also contribute to improving the transfer of knowledge. With regard to mass media, Mr. Chairman, and advertising, the current restrictions are all simply outdated Former NERA Secretary Habiton noted that the initial fears of brainwashing by foreign investors through the use of mass media is no longer relevant since Filipinos already have access to vast array of media content all over the world through the internet. Second is the need for flexibility in the part of Congress. Amending or outright removal of these restrictive economic provisions will enable the Philippines to get the type of investors who will bring in much needed investments and create jobs in key sectors. Having restrictions on the equity participation of foreign, earth, foreign investors in the constitution removes that flexibility of the government to adjust or amend existing laws for restricted sectors in case there is a need to adapt to changes in technology to meet the requirements of FTAs, the Philippines wishes to adjoin and to take advantage of investors looking to enter the growing Philippine economy. The Philippines, as mentioned earlier, is the only country in ASEAN where restrictions in foreign ownership are embodied in the constitution. What is the results it can bring such as the transfer of technology 
and skills transfers of Filipino workers. Bodman and Lay in 2013 studied the impact of FDI in developing countries in terms of positive spillover effects in R&D and skills training for local workers. Countries that have embraced a more open economy to FDI grew significantly faster than others who are more protectionist. Bodman and Lay noted that there is a direct enhancement in terms of technological levels that FDI brings, which allows the local labor force to learn from foreign technological sources. Create a more competitive economy, the Philippines needs further adaptation to new technology and to reskill and upskill Filipino workers and influx of FDI can help the government in pursuing this. In terms of the modes of amendment, Mr. Chairman, we recommend that Congress convene as a constituent assembly as more time and cost efficient as more time and cost efficient option. You know? In contrast, a constitutional convention like removing the restrictive economic provisions in the Constitution through a joint and concurrent resolution of both houses of Congress. It would only take months to complete the process. If done to count on the salaries and allowances of the delegates and members still have to be paid, the count on delegates also shall be entitled to a place where they can hold sessions. With tight fiscal space, the government will have Difficulty justifying additional expenses to construct a new building or renting an existing one. In the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I can submit the more specific amendments uh, to your committee through the secretary. We also have, Mr. Chair, we also have a, some Q&A that might be helpful to support our argument. But in summary, Mr. Chairman, with the passage of recent economic reforms, such as the amendments to the Foreign Investment Act, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Public Service Act, the outright removal of the remaining restrictive economic provisions would make a very significant difference in the attractiveness of the country. Lifting the restrictive economic provisions sends, sends a clear signal to foreign investors that are indeed welcome to invest and do business in the Philippines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Gary Tevez. So that would end the uh, presentations of our resource persons. And so therefore, I'd like to turn over again to uh, Senior Vice Chairperson Anone Defensor to proceed with the uh, interpolation and discussions from our members of Congress both physically present and also those in Zoom. For those in Zoom, just, uh, just indicate uh, whether you would want to ask questions to our distinguished panel. Yes, no, no, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I really appreciate the empirical data presented by Dr. Monsod and Mr. Sunny Africa. It brings to light the evidence on paper as well as independent third-party studies regarding the correlation of FDIs to our economy. But on a pragmatic note, The telecommunications and transportation industries are considered as public utilities, therefore limited to 60% ownership by Filipinos. However, we have seen that our telecommunications industry has not developed. We have one of the slowest in 
Asia. Up to now, our transportation system relies on the Philippine National Railway with no investments from uh, foreign investors. We have two or three major telecommunication companies that deliver service to us. And coming from a two-year pandemic, it has worsened the state of our education considering our online classes. Why our telecommunications and That's just one question. Thank you. our transportation sector to foreign, 100% foreign investors? Well, it depends. If, if you're talking about opening it to foreign investment for the ownership of a rail line, uh, You know, looking at the Philippines, you know, it depends on which foreign investor there is. I agree with you, ma'am. I okay. have, I also have clear reservations about investments from uh, from China, yeah. where we cannot be sure. But opening up the transportation sector, including rail, it also opens the doors to other Western investors on in rail, like France, Australia, Japan, and Singapore, who have the technology. That the technology transfer, the R&D, as well as the infusion of capital so that we can improve our rail and transportation sector. 40%? Give them 40%. Give them 49%. Yes. But we must keep 51%. Can I hear from Mr. Africa, sir? Um, I know here in the Philippines, it seems like there's a tidal wave of opening up to foreign investment, including in utilities. But um, for instance, in Europe right now, um, France actually still regulates telecommunication and transport. Uh, Italy, I think just last year, introduced new controls on foreign investment in ports, airports, um, motorways, actually exactly the same things that we're liberalizing now in, in the railways. Um, so I think there is a distinction between having the infrastructure there to it leading to development. Um, having the infrastructure there, I, would, I, I do agree there are national security considerations national to, security to who considerations. Um, invests in these critical sectors. Um, and I think we can't be in the skimmit about we need it, so let, let it come in. Um, but the second point about infrastructure development, we actually do argue that a lot of our infrastructure projects right now are not the high impact money for a big bang for your buck um, infrastructure projects. Um, I do recall during the Duterte administration, we wrote to literally every infrastructure agency to ask them for any study about the claims of the economic managers about the biggest, it's a quote unquote, biggest multiplier effect of infrastructure. We wrote the DOF, we wrote NEDA, BCDA, DPWH, we wrote everyone, no one replied except for the DOF. And then the DOF, after like our fifth inquiry, they said, we don't have such studies. And I think, again, there are many things that we should question, not take for granted. We would argue more bang for, the, for our buck multiplier for the Philippine economy to invest in rural infrastructure. Pinag-usapan lang nito manakarambuan, bakit walang cold storage para sa sibuyas. I mean, it doesn't make sense that we're spending so much on these big tech infrastructure projects. Okay, baka makatunan sa traffic, but... Again, in terms of multiplier, I think we should be more circumspect about um, thinking that these big... We big accept uh, the data that you presented earlier, and we really appreciate that. But can you give us a concrete recommendation 
paano natin mapapaganda itong dalawang industriya as an economist to encourage the private sector? Sige, ma'am. Sige, I don't ma'am. think it needs the constitution, sir. Yes. All you have to do, I mean, that's not all because it's not easy. Yes, ma'am. You have to improve governance. <laughs> you have to improve the macroeconomic fundamentals. Agree, you to, agree. You have to do all that. You have to do the, improve the ease of doing business. And then they will come in. As of now, uh, the the study of Parcon Santos comes out and tele- the foreign investors come in and invest in tele- in telecommunications two point i think i, I think it's 2.8% if you put that slide on yes, you will see that transportation and uh, telecommunications is very very small of what foreign investors want to invest in and this is through the asean the asean five that i was talking about so um you want them to come in you make it easy for them to come in. Is it also a factor that they have no majority or controlling stake in the investment I, company that will bring in their investment? Could it be a factor, ma'am? Well, I I just told you what the results of their study. Foreign equity restrictions were not, <laughs> were not a significant uh, factor. As a matter of fact, well, you, you, you can see China with all its restrictions was the biggest host country. And then the Philippines, when it was it when it became the most the most restrictive, that was the time when it got the most uh in investor attractiveness. So I my point is don't use the constitution as the source of either hate or love for, for coming into the Philippines as investment country. If we do good business, they'll come in. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have no further yes, questions, what, Chair. Uh, I, see the, I see the hand of our uh, of uh, Secretary Sikat. Yes, Dr. Sikat. Uh, I, I do not know the question that was asked, but from the answers that I was listening to, I can sense what the question was. Uh, I think you're asking, do you welcome foreign investments in these sectors, in infrastructure, in the critical industries, and so on? I I welcome uh, foreign investments in these sectors very much. Some of the sect- some of the transportation problems we have we cannot solve in the next ten years. Maybe in the next twenty years we cannot solve them as fast as we want them to be coming in. So we could invite foreign capital uh, to to participate in this. It doesn't have to be 100%. It can be with some allowance for domestic participation. In fact, it should allow for participation in the public, uh, in the private market. So there should be an opening to of, of, of these investments to participation of private people helping to invest. Uh, it should, government can come in also to partner. Uh, any mode will be helpful that is that pushes the project and gets it going. I'd rather have a bridge constructed between one and another part of the country when it would take years to have it done, when in fact, if we could have a toll bridge that is controlled by uh, foreign capital, will allow all of us to move forward, back and forth reduce the weight, reduce the cost of transporting, redirect traffic here and there, and so on. I, I think the concern that we we don't have, that, that we must have our own uh, people to run it is, is uh, probably a mistaken concern. Why? Because if we were waiting for that, we will not be able to accomplish much in economic development. Uh, and uh, the examples I said, we, we probably, lo- I mean, sometimes I think of, I think of the failures of the 1980s uh, as a loss of maybe one decade or two, because, you know, uh, we, we got confused one way or the other. 
the one the one, one was kicked out the other one the ones that came in didn't make good decisions either come on uh, and uh, well come on come on <laughs> take come a look on. oh come on look at the what Pub public uh, right so uh power we, you can, power we can, yeah. Power Hi. Yeah. yeah we can hear you later uh yeah dr Rini, but let, we let's let we, we let the secretary uh dr yeah, we have to finish. Yeah. one way or the other we cannot say that the failures of the present or the some of the failures that they had not come were due to the fact that one uh one uh, uh government failed to do them because decisions that came later prevented a lot of decisions from becoming better. Well, uh, we, that's a debatable issue, I, I agree. And uh, we can debate that for a long time, but our electrical power is very costly. Our transport system became, became deteriorated in the five to 10, systems and now we're just beginning to do some of the water capturing systems to help manila become a much better country with better service in water supply why well you, you you count all those things and you'll discover that if you study them carefully you will not you will find a lot of busy steps i cannot say that uh, the busy steps were due to one person it says system failure. People thought they could change the world. And the system failure really created a two decade failure for the economy. This, this to me is, uh, is at least a, a, a major point. But thank you. Let, let, me, let me just point out about, about the need to modernize transportation systems. We can we we can we can accelerate this if we allow foreign capital. Now I must say another. I, I must make another point. We always say foreign uh, amending the constitution will not help very much, or it will not even help because macro must be attended to. Governance must be attended to. You know, governance failure is probably the result of some of the institutional factors that were created by the original provisions of the constitution that made that made a lot of us want to do this increased rent seeking within the system by a lot of factors by businessmen by even i must say even politicians my my uh, apologies but uh, <laughs> leadership Yes. Anyway, anyway, uh, we say that we we need to we we need to uh, it's it's not it's it's not a sufficient condition. I agree. Amending the constitution is not a sufficient condition, but improving macro and all these things sometimes they help. They, they, these are these are interconnected items like the increase in foreign capital that propelled many of these countries in our neighborhood, not ours, made them create large amounts of export surpluses that made the economies strong. They accelerated the growth of their GDP. What happened next? Pretty soon they owned the industries that, were, that used to belong to the foreigners. In fact, many of the industries that were fueled by foreign capital in these countries, in the, port, in the tiger economies, especially in Taiwan and in South Korea, they were originally foreign capital. As they improved the original foreign capitalists, they allowed new, uh, new investors, I mean, the investors to, to run them, and they became the owners. Anyway, Thank you, it sir. seems that uh, I have talked a lot. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. May I recognize briefly uh, Dr. Fabelia? Thank you. Um, when he um, tabled the, uh, the idea that um, 
if you have corruption and you have uh, bad governance and you have even bad rules, um, foreign investors will still not come in, even if you liberalize. That's true. I, I have no. I was a um, a, a, a uh, resource person in the first two years ago uh, when the thirty was still president, and my my point was selling the country. You have to have a better mousetrap, <laughs> and a better mousetrap is not one feature. Selling a hotel, which has many problems like bad security, uh, bad toilets, bad uh, roof, bad, you fix one and the clients will still not come. Winnie, that's accepted. That's why I never premise my, my position by promising the Rose Garden, never. Thank you, Dr. Fabel. Wait, I'll tell you a, a story, a, a little story. It's not, it's, it's not statistical, but this is an actual story. In 2016, the Supreme Court of the Philippines told the Philippine government to pay Piaco 25 billion pesos. Now, what is the wherewithal of this cost? The wherewithal of this cost is that um, the uh, PPP of, of Piatco, of, of, of the Terminal 3, uh, the uh, rapport could have been the sole owner of, of that uh, PPP, but it could not because the Constitution. Now, to be able to come in, they had to find a dummy. And the dummy was found. And as usual, with, in, in the uh, course of events, there were corrupt practices, etc. But the fact of the matter is, 2002, the airport was delivered. But the presidency of uh, the, the presidency of the time simply decided, we'll fight it in court. Let's not operate it, because if we operate it, we'll reduce our chances of winning in the courts. So we had 10 years where the, the asset was mutable, essentially could have earned back the 25 billion pesos that was spent. Had the constitution allowed full ownership by by Fraport. This should not have happened. That is my, my contention. Of course, it can be wrong. So the constitutional restraint on ownership in this particular instance cost 25 billion pesos to the Filipino people. No, I'm not, you can, you can read the record. And so I say, that it can be costly. It can be costly to us. At least in this particular instance, it was costly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fabelia. Next, we have the Honorable Raul Manuel of Kabataan Party List. Ah. Sir, would you, would you like to be recognized? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to comment that, uh, again, um, we are talking about uh, empirical data, and the Philippines is the most concentrated economy in, in Asia, according to the World Bank. That means monopolies and oligopolies dominate uh, industries, specific strategic industries. And we know this for a fact, especially in telecommunications uh, and in transport. No? So that's the reason why investors are not coming in, because, uh, because they because uh, we suffer from high prices and low quality of goods. Uh, at the same time, um, some of these strategic industries, as you pointed out, the honorable defense these are capital intensive like railways and telecommunications. Um, and we si simply do not have the capital for that. In fact, uh, the two dominant players are actually have heavy foreign uh, 
um, share, you know, Globe and uh, Smart are actually majority owned by uh, foreign uh, companies. No, but if we have these restrictions, we attract the wrong kind of investors. Those who are willing to, um, you know, skirt our laws. You know, as as uh, as um, Dr. Fabella has mentioned, this uh, this uh, increases the cost. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we attract the, we do not attract the world class players who are not willing to uh, become a minority, who are not willing to bribe, etc. No, so um, uh, we need to remove all this, these restrictions to, to break up uh, these monopolies, allow for freer entry into the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I recognize the Honorable Manuel? You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Isa po sa mga narinig ko kanina na nag-strike sa akin ay yung uh, pagbanggit na ngayon pa nga lang, bukas na yung ating uh, ekonomiya dun sa pagpasok ng mga big uh, foreign corporations. At uh, syempre meron itong uh, consequences dun sa paano naman yung uh, pagnanais ng ating bansa na makatayo din no, sa sariling paan ng hindi masyado nakadepende dun sa mga banyaga. Kaya naman, uh, ako at this point, meron akong uh, reservations dun sa mga proposals na tanggalin yung mga provisions sa ating konstitusyon na nagtatakda na bawal yung 100% foreign ownership ng mga iba't ibang uh, sector sa ating uh, economy. Uh, Mr. Chair, bago ako mag-proceed sa aking question, nabanggit kasi kanina yung tungkol sa case ng uh, China. Uh, in particular, yung uh, Ibon Foundation merong na-present na data na meron ding mga uh, figures tungkol sa kung paano ba nag-progress in China through time. And uh, I think factual no? for us to say na dati yung China, edi napakataas ng uh, poverty rate, uh, mataas din yung uh, mortality no? pagdating sa mga uh, kakapanganak na mga bata, ang pangit ng conditions. Pero ngayon ay uh, nakahabol no? at uh, Kino-consider nga ng United States bilang uh, kanyang kalaban sa ekonomiya. Concerned ako, Mr. Chair, dun sa paano nag-develop in China, paano niya naabot yung ganung significant stride sa kanyang ekonomi, at kung meron bang uh, malaking factor doon yung uh, kanyang pagiging restrictive, anong papel doon ng uh, foreign direct investment. So I'd like to direct uh, such a question to uh, Mr. Sunny Africa of Ibon Foundation. Since kanina nagpresent ang data, I wanted to be expounded further. Thank you po ang hirap ng tanong. Um, pero I think yung, yung categorically pwede sabihin, hindi nag-develop ang China based on sa textbook na neoclassical economics na ibukas mo at hayaan yung pamilihan. Um, may long history of socialist construction yung China um, through long periods of, again, trial and error in their part. Um, na-develop nila yung human capital nila, na-develop yung kakayanan, kalusugan na kanilang mamayan, kahit pa paano, despite uh, famines and any whatever problems, sa na din agrikultura. So it got to the point na by the 70s and 1980s, there was a foundation for them to build on. At nung nagbukas sila, with the, um, with the death of Mao Zedong, nung nagbukas sila, very calibrated din. And sa amin, very key yung point na yun. Eh. Kasi hanggang sa ngayon, yung China, grabe yung pakikialam sa ekonomiya. Kahit mo pasok sa WTO, ang daming kaso laban sa China sa paglabag nun. Pero magaling mga abogado nila, nasasangga nila. Tapos, the last 10 years, patay ng WTO kasi um, yung US ayaw maglagay ng tao dun sa dispute settlement body nila. Hindi nagka-progress. Pero ang thinking yung pinaki point dun, walang honest assessment ng China na magsasabi ito ay umunlad dahil sa globalization, dahil sa liberalization. Ginamit nila yung pagbukas ng ibang mga bansa sa kanilang produkto pero pinalakas sila sa sarili nila 
hindi batay dun sa malayang pamilihan. Pwede na kasi na sarili nila batay sa state capital. Grabe yung pagkontrol ng pinansya sa China. Of course, pinupo na ngayon na tinatago yung utang. Pero grabe yung pagkontrol ng pinansya ng China within the economy, within economic sectors, and even capital controls, labas pasok na ng bansa. So sa amin, ang kailangan mas stress doon, kung namamangha tayo sa China, kahit sabihin na exceptional yan kasi, well, biggest country in the world, etc. Ang point is, yung governance mechanisms sa economy, pakikialam talaga. And I think there are lessons to be taken from that. And I would actually challenge anyone who thinks na uubarin textbooks. To give an example, walang, sa amin, key point to, in the last 40 years ng globalization, walang breakout example of an industrializing country. Because yung pagbubukas sa malayang pamilihan, kinompromiso yung kakayanan ng mga bansa na palakasan yung kanilang um, lokal na industriya. The last breakout industrializers were South Korea and Taiwan. That was so long ago. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Chair. Edi sa ngayon meron tayong 60-40 na restriction. Uh, 60% dapat ay pagmamayari ng mga Pilipino, uh, 40% lang yung pwede sa mga banyaga. However, uh, Mr. Chair, may mga naririnig tayo na nga, nabanggit din nata kanina tungkol sa mga uh, dummies, paglalagay ng mga dummy para maikutan ang ganong restrictions na nakaset sa ating constitution. Uh, I'm curious if ever lang po, Mr. Chair, meron po bang uh, nakapag-conduct ng uh, pag-aaral or case studies pagdating sa mga dummy companies? Uh, gaano ba kadami yung instances or uh, yung ganitong scheme ba? Uh, aling mga sectors ng ating economy yung merong uh, ganon? I'm bringing up this, uh, Mr. Chair, kasi kung... Ngayon pa nga lang na merong uh, restrictions eh may ganung paraan pa rin ano how much more no na mas lantaran na siya kapag wala na yung restrictions at all so if ever po ba anyone among our resource persons uh, pero uh, at the moment po uh, edi uh, kung wala po ready at hand no I would be uh, happy to receive uh, maybe supporting documents but I think Dr. Fabella is uh, raising his hand the case of Biatko is a case where the the uh, the 6040 restriction created a a corruption uh, arena so there's these are not independent things eh? if there's corruption yes foreign investors will not come but the corruption itself could be indigenous to the fact that we have these restrictions. You know, point ni Dr. Sikat. You know, point ni Dr. Ni Dr. Tichikyamko. Sorry, Toti, no? That the, uh, no, yes, there is corruption, but the corrupt part of that corruption is actually derived from the fact that we have these restrictions. Okay. Yes, I'd be uh, willing to hear. About the Piatko case, Fraport came in. Fraport was 40%, and the, and the local partners were 60%. And they needed more money, and Fraport wanted to give more money. And Fraport went to a, to a law office here and said, you know, what? Can we can we give more money? And the law office said no. You know, in other words, they wanted to give more money. So Fraport was illegal in the sense that it went and gave the money. Although it was it was not. I mean, they still had forty percent, but they gave the money. It was a, a loan or something, whatever it is, or whether it was some sort of under the table deal, I don't know. But Fraport came in with its eyes wide open. And by the way, Fraport won that what Fraport and I don't know what the yeah. There was the that that airport was supposed to be done by a consortium of Filipino businessmen, Taipans. That's right, emerging dragons. And the yung Fraport because they had 
in, in other words, there, it was not as if there was no investment that would have been made in that area if Fraport, was, if Fraport had not been there. Emerging Dragons actually had that had the contract and something went, you know, I mean, business-wise, there was a, I think that was in Ramos's time, there was a, some sort of situation there where there was, it was in, sort of under the table. I don't know what happened, but Fraport has been known, has been known to have been punished for its corporate, for its, um, for its corruption activities in other countries. So let us not talk about Fraport as wow, somebody that that came in and would have done very good. It it happened in Peru with Fraport. It happened. I mean, Fraport was made to pay by the German government for for going against its its laws. So I mean, I don't think that is quite an example of the kind of foreign investment we want. The point I'm trying to make, Mr. Chairman and honorable members, is there is this study that specifically put in foreign restrictiveness, I mean, foreign direct investment restrictiveness, specifically put in as an explanation, all right, Par Con Santos, which just cut 21, five countries, nine years, etc., And they came out with the conclusion that foreign restrictiveness was not a factor if the other factors were there. So, I mean, that's my direct evidence. It's not a story. It's, it's, it's an empirical study, and it shows that. And as a matter of fact, in the when they they when when they divided the countries the source countries as asian and non asian for the asian countries foreign restrictiveness might, had a positive and significant for the non asians talagang i mean sorry for the non for the asians there was a negative relationship between foreign restrictiveness and investment for the for the non Asians, United States, Canada, United Kingdom, etc., foreign foreign restrictiveness actually had a positive relationship, and it was puzzling. So that's why they went through another set of of estimations to find out what was the what was the real story, and they came out with this, the fact that for all foreign restrictiveness disappeared as a fact as an important factor. Uh, affecting foreign direct investment as long as there was this other ease of doing business governance. That's what the studies showed. Now, if you can show me any study that shows that foreign restricting this actually, you know, prevented investments from coming in, I will be glad to show it. But this is evidence-based. This is what actually happened. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, is that your last question? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have uh, a few more uh, questions. So uh, Two minutes. Para si Congress okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to direct my next question to uh, Dr. Aris Arugay. I hope that uh, he has uh, scrutinized the proposals that would affect uh, the terms of uh, public officials. Nabagit kasi kanina yung designated survivor bill na nagtatakda na kung hindi na kaya ng presidente, vice president na magsilbe, sino ba yung pwede maging kapalit? At uh, nakahanay ang uh, isang miyembro ng uh, cabinet. Uh, uh, can uh, Dr. Aris confirm? Yeah, uh, that seems to be, I think that could be the, that element of having a member of the executive cabinet as uh, a possible successor to or included in the line of succession. I think that derives inspiration from the U.S. model. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that our presidential system is largely patterned, but not totally patterned after the American model of presidentialism. Okay. So, uh, 
pwede na maging bahagi ng cabinet ang uh, isang uh, appointee kahit na nagsilbi na siya dati Mabawa, bilang isang presidente o vice-presidente, hypothetically. Yeah. Uh, let me just give a background. Why are cabinet members uh, in the line of succession in the U.S. model of presidentialism? Uh, this is because the uh, institutional norms and culture of American presidentialism gives some autonomous powers to the cabinet no? while they are appointed. By the president, uh, American political development somehow provided certain semi, you might say, relative autonomous powers to members of the cabinet. If you look at the American Constitution, uh, by the signature of a certain number of cabinet members, uh, the president could actually be re removed from office, no? which we do not have no? in our current constitution. So I think by uh, because they enacted the law on constitutional succession, the, the fact that there are cabinet members there, and we all know that cabinet members are not elected, unlike the president and the vice president, uh, it is their evolution in institutional norms to put a premium on executive cabinet members in the line of succession, which we correspondingly do not have uh, because cabinet members... Uh, in the Philippine political system are not only directly elected by the president, but their powers are quite derivative from the uh, powers of the chief executive. Uh, okay. So, uh, may nisip kasi akong uh, senaryo sa mga posibilidad ng pwedeng buksan kapag uh, mangyari itong mga panukala na nakahain sa atin ngayon. Kasi, Uh, example, ang isang presidente, natapos niya na yung kanyang uh, dalawang termino should uh, this proposed uh, amendments uh, be adopted. Pero pwede pa siyang ma-appoint na maging bahagi ng cabinet. Tama po ba? Yes. Ibig sabihin, pagkatapos ng kanyang dalawang termino bilang presidente, kung maging bahagi siya ng cabinet, nasa line of succession siya, mm -hmm. Para later on, pwede pa rin siyang maging presidente ulit. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, although, uh, Honorable Manuel, uh, Representative Manuel, we also know that uh, uh, prevailing, and this I'm not a lawyer to, to, to uh, substantively uh, affirm this, that uh, certain jurisprudence have already somehow put the rule that once you served as president, that you cannot really run anymore for another term. So you, you will only serve that six years. So yung sinasabi nyo pong pwedeng maging loophole siya, no? na meaning a former president, uh, given this designated uh, survivor bill to become president, uh, we need more details in the sense of he, will, he or she or they will only be acting president. And uh, acting president until a new president is either selected by Congress or elected by directly by the people. Thank okay. you, Dr. Thank you. May I recognize the Honorable Franz Castro for her questions? Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, maraming salamat sa ating mga resource speakers sa ngayon. Sa ngayon no? Marami tayong mga natutunan in terms of economic na mga provisions. So, uh, tanong ko lang, Mr. Chair, kung kasi dahil doon sa mga present ni Dr. Arugay no, na mga survey about the Filipinos, uh, ano, no, yung kanilang pagtanaw about the cha-cha, uh, yung amendments, at saka yung kanilang mga concerns. So, pwede po ba kaya, Mr. Chair, uh, before we go to the cha-cha, no, mag, mag, mag ano muna tayo ng talagang general survey sa ating mga mamamayan? Kung talagang gusto nila yung cha-cha, bago tayo magpatuloy ng mga ganitong usapin. Kasi sa nakikita natin sa ngayon, uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> sorry ah, sa ngayon nga lang, uh, dis uh, marami mga disinterested na mga colleagues tayo no, na hindi naman talaga. Ano, I'm, <laughs> siguro dahil sa araw ngayon, marami nag-uwian or ano, whatever. So, kailangan talaga ang... Uh, charter change, ang mga constitutional na mga pagbabago, nilalaho kanya ng marami ng mamamayan. Kasi napakahalaga, this is a fundamental, fundamental law of the land. 
So, kailangan ng participation ng ating mga mamamayan. So, would it be possible sa ating mga constitutionalists na mag-conduct muna tayo, halimbawa ng survey, kung talagang gusto ba nilang baguhin ang constitution at this time or what? So, ano tingin ni Dr. Arugay doon, Mr. Chair? Uh, uh, definitely po, no? But if uh, our department also recommends going beyond simply a survey, no? Na... Sempre randomly selected yan, 1,200, that uh, consultations no, direct uh, to all popular sectors by maybe an independent body that Congress may create can do really a, a nationwide uh, pulse sensing of the popular sentiment. And this was actually done uh, in other countries, you know, particularly in New Zealand, when they changed their electoral system, you know, they actually, Parliament actually created an independent body that went around the country and solicited, you know, uh, and but but beyond soliciting the proposals, just to have a feel of, kasi po magbabago tayong constitution ng karamihan sa ating mga kababayan ni hindi to nabasa, hindi uh, sabi ni uh, Professor Medalia, masyado daw mahaba, ganun, no? But there are countries wherein the people actually really owned the constitution. They they have pocket versions of it in their in in sa mga bulsa nila, no? Sa Latin America, sa Venezuela for example, because that is also their way to activate and assert their rights according to the constitution. But if we don't have that buy-in, popular buy-in, medyo mahihirapan po, there will always be clouds of doubt, of skepticism. So I think it will be to the best service of the nation if there is local ownership of the process and there is buy-in from the bottom, not merely by the top. Uh, thank you. No? Meron, din, meron na palang ganyang nangyari sa ibang bansa. So baka pwede natin gawin yun, no, Mr. Chair, no? For your, with your initiative bago itong ano. No? Um, so, ayun, kasi nakaka-worry, Mr. Chair, Ito, 37 years na itong constitution natin and yet 80% ng ating population hindi man lang alam ito. Kaya maraming mga, sorry, maraming mga violations sa constitution, human rights, uh, mga human rights violations, etc. Agawan ng lupa. So, ayun, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, next, ang um, question ko po, uh, Mr. Chair, yung tungkol dun sa lupa. Kasi ito lang naman yung pinag-uusapan natin, restriction on the ownership of the land. Malinaw yung present ni Dr. Monsoda no about the empirical data na open naman na lahat. ba? Open na lahat. Wala naman ang tayong restrictions eh. Pero bakit hindi nagpupunta yung ating mga foreign foreign investment o hindi man ganun kalaki dahil sa good governance, dahil sa governance, uh, nakita ko rin Mr. Chair, ba? Marami rin tayong mga erratic and unstable na mga government policies na natatakot din yung mga foreign investors na pumunta rito. So, ang dami yan. Baka dapat nating reviewin yan. Ano-ano ba yung mga tingin ng mga foreign investors dito na, o kahit na yung ating mga uh, national bureaucrat o yung mga kapitalist dito sa Pilipinas, na tingin nila nagiging hadlang dun sa pag-flourish ng mga, mga businesses dito. Kaya, yun, uh, governance, and stability of policies, etc., at ito, nag-worry ako, yung ownership of the land. Alam nyo po, Mr. Chair, nakita naman natin sa mga magsasaka natin, life, land is life sa kanila. Kapag i-open na natin ito sa foreigner, anong, 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 anong magiging pana, panalo ng ating mga ind indigenous people, yung mga mahirap na magsasaka? So, agamitin lang yung kanilang kondisyon eh, ng kahirapan bibili na lahat yung land. Wala nang matitira sa ating mga mamayan. Kaya, hindi tayo papayag, Mr. Chair, na talagang i-open ito 100% yung ownership ng land. Ano? At talagang uh, very, delikado po yan sa national security. Baka later on, wala nang, wala nang, wala nang lupa ang mga, mga Filipino. So, um, ayun po. Um, meron bang uh, study, uh, halimbawa sa, sa, sa UP, ma Mr. Chair, as regards doon sa mga foreign, in, uh, as regards to din doon sa, kasi alam natin marami na rin namang foreign investors na, halimbawa kat, katulad po ng totoo po pa yun, mga condominium, na, mga foreigners, nag-aari din siya 100%. 
Tama po ba yun? Uh, may, may ganun po ba na alo, ay mga condominiums, yung mga, ano, mga foreigners na kapag arin 100%? 50% of the condominium um, apartments yes. can be owned by foreigners. So you Because that's 40%. Mm -hmm. All right. But gusto ko sana mag... I mean, isagot yung tanong niyo about land yes. being had lang ba yun yes. sa foreign direct investment? Hindi, Hindi po. Miski, uh, even if they don't need, I mean, if they don't, they cannot own the land. Meron tayong lease 50 years, nagiging up to 75 years. Diyos ko, hindi na nila. Sino mag, magkakaroon ng, you know, I want to own the land, basta. And if I will not, I will not go in if I cannot own the land. No, they can own the land for 50 years. They can own the land for 75 years. That's, that's, so that is not a hadlang. So that constitutional provision does not have to be removed because it is not a hadlang. But, but even if all these constitutional provisions are removed, hindi pa rin tayo makakasiguro na darating ang foreign direct investment kasi nga wala tayong, <laughs> wala tayong infrastructure, wala tayong ease of doing business, ang sama-sama ng governance natin, wala tayong rule of law. Diyos ko, bakit sila pupunta rito? Tell me, please. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, yes, we recognize uh, Dr. Sikat. May I just make a little point? It's a small point, but I think uh, it's worth thinking about it. These restrictions in the Constitution, they foment a lot of bad re results, like uh, dummies, as mentioned. You can name them in very different uh, industries. There are dummy situations. Land ownership is another issue. Uh, uh, we, we want people should not really care about who owns the land, but some people do. Uh, a lot of people, sensitive people, do. They want to. They want to be sure that they can live on a land that is at least titled to them, not necessarily titled totally, but uh, something that they can claim to be part of their assets, so that they can use it as a as as an asset to be traded. Uh, Look at the pictures we get about our agriculture. Our agriculture is one of the areas where little investments of foreign capital has really come in. Why? Because of all our fears, the fear that uh, land might be owned by foreigners and so on. We forget that the land is in this country. We forget that we can tax the land. We, can, we, can, we forget that we have the regulatory powers to 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 have the to have land use and so on and most important of course we can legislate about land for specific issues but don't legislate it in the legisl in the constitution that's one of the things that has really caused major problems if you look at uh, if you look at the tourism sector there are lots of uh, foreigners in the tourism sector we just don't know them they're married to filipinos well, you can you 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 can make a guess about what happens. It distorts our demographics. Anyway, I'm just making a point. Okay. Uh, I yes, we'd like to listen to uh, Secretary Gary. Yeah. Uh, if if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to reinforce what Dr. Sikat said, and it might be a very pra pragmatic situation, Mr. Chairman, and many of our congressmen come from the provinces you know? and then we see a lot of land in our provinces that are underutilized and like in Singapore and Malaysia meron namang restrictions that can be imposed and the pragmatic is uh, consideration here is kung yung pag ng lupa ay for the use of the foreigners like magtatayo sa ng bahay po or magtatayo ng negosyo Yung title niya ay eh, pwede niya magamit para humiram sa banko to supplement what he will put as equity. Pagtatayo po tayo ng bahay, nakaka-employ na tayo ng mga uh, trabahante para tumulong sa pagtatayo ng bahay. So that will add to the employment situation 
in the countryside. Doon naman sa factory po, sa uh, kung gagamitin din po niya yung lupain niya, eh, may title na rin siya, pwede siyang pumunta sa banko, he puts in his equity, ang balance ay domestic capital, makakapagtayo siya ng factory doon sa mga barangays uh, at ibang lugar na suitable sa mga factories na po yan. So, ang, siguro ang pragmatic situation there, gamitin din ang land use uh, studies or policy para malaman natin kung where these uh, suitable areas are where foreign investors can add businesses and, and, and uh, other activities to generate employment po. Ang kagandahan yan, sabi nga ni Jerry, Dr. Jerry, pagtanggalin yan, Congress can really subsequently make modifications sa bawat uh, uh, provisions na tinanggalan natin dyan sa Constitution. There's flexibility. Mahirap po yung kung sa Constitution eh. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments from our members? No more? Okay. So on that note, we would like to thank the Committee on Constitutional Amendments. We'd like to thank our very valued resource persons this afternoon for being able to give us our uh, many, many insights and uh, data uh, regarding the present uh, proposition to whether amend or not. And so with that, I would like, as the chairman, you know, during the pandemic, uh, instead of revising my law books, I decided to write a song hit. Now, this is not about the Constitution, but singing is definitely better than, uh, you know, a hard discussion on the Constitution. So I will give, as I have given to the uh, our research persons uh, this morning, all of you will receive three uh, volumes. The first volume, uh, I was serious on this. Uh, <laughs> so first volume is the volume that is the English songs from the U.S. Billboard Top 100, becoming famous here in uh, the Philippines. Of the Top 100, 60 came to the Philippines because we were under American rule, and we still have that. The second one is also from uh, English, and the third one we are, are what you call uh, Spanish songs, Italian arias, and then the regional songs, no, Chabaka, right? uh, Kampapangan, My Bisaya, Lahat. And then the Christmas songs and the Tagalog songs. So, uh, thank you very much. I hope you'll enjoy. How many songs did you uh, We have about uh, 2,500 songs. My all. If I want. So, uh, please sing all of them. <laughs> and so, thank you. And Toti, can, uh, Toti, can you bring this to our good friend, your, your brother in law, Tony Olison? Okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. And uh, we will present to you our, our findings and our matrix. And certainly, your discussions and presentations are very valued and helpful to this committee. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. A picture. Let's have a picture for our uh, documentation.
Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn our committee hearing for today. The meeting, uh, the hearings for today are hereby adjourned. All right.